On behalf of Santa Group, I'm delighted uh, to uh, be able to thank our hosts, uh, Alison Harcourt and the whole Exeter team for their hosting this biennial regulatory governance conference. Um, they're doing a, a great job. Um, it's always a challenge running these events during the pandemic and uh, I've certainly had some great interactions over the past day and look forward to more. This is one of two standard group sessions today. Uh, this uh, ceremonial one now, and then our business meeting at 1300 hours Exeter time later today, to which all are invited. And I'm delighted to welcome you to this very special session of the conference to present our two major biennial awards. Uh, the standing group was established in 2005. It has a mission to support the development of the interdisciplinary field of regulatory governance, the conferences and seminars, and through the giving of awards and prizes. And we are giving our two major awards this morning, the Regulatory Studies Development Award, given to a senior scholar in recognition of their development of the field of regulatory governance, and the Gian Domenico Mioni Prize for an early career paper presented at this conference. Prior recipients of the Regulatory Studies Award have been David levy Four, uh, Julia Black, and Asim Prakash, and we will keep you guessing on who the Mioni Prize uh, will be presented to later. I'll announce that towards the end of the session. But our first responsibility is to present the Regulatory Studies Award, and I'm delighted we have John Braithwaite with us today. I'm thrilled uh, uh, John is with us virtually to receive the award and also to give the award lecture. And I wish also to give a warm welcome to Valerie Braithwaite, a leading scholar in the field of regulatory governance who's worked so closely with John, both in scholarship and also in life. Um, so a little bit about John. Uh, John, it will be known to all of you. Uh, he's a distinguished uh, professor emeritus and founder of the Regulatory Institutions Network at the Australian National University. He's a criminologist originally whose empirical and theoretical research on corporate crime and regulatory governance has been extremely influential in developing the interdisciplinary field of regulatory governance and amongst John's remarkable research output of hundreds of articles, book chapters, edited books and books across an unusually wide range of empirical and theoretical fields, it's possible to point to the immense impact of a number of books especially, but not limited to the co-authored books, uh, Responsive Regulation with Ian Ayres in 1992, Global Business Regulation with Peter Drahosh in 2000, the sole authored Regulatory Capitalism in 2008, and amongst the core concepts in the field of regulatory governance, which John has led often collaboratively with other key scholars on developing and applying, include responsive regulation, reintegrative shaming, meta-regulation, and regulatory capitalism. Since 2004, he has substantially focused his research on comparative peace building, applying a similar theoretical lens and equal theoretical rigor, empirical insight, and humanity to major societal challenges associated with supporting global efforts to secure peace in some of the most troubled uh, parts of the world. In addition to his path-breaking and highly influential scholarship, John has been a leader in building the field of regulatory governance, establishing the Regulatory Institutions Network at ANU, supervising and mentoring countless students and researchers, both formally and informally, building engagement between his research and numerous practice fields, and as a founding co-editor of Regulatory Governance. I could say much more about John's lifetime of contributions and achievements, but wish now uh, just to say on behalf of the ECPR Standard Group on Regulatory Governance, we are delighted and honoured to be able to present the Regulatory Studies Development Award to you today. And John, I have the, I have the award uh, certificate here, which through the magic of the internet, I am going to endeavour to present to you virtually. So here it comes. You ready for it? Have you got it there? Oh, terrific. Oh, we've lost, we've lost a colour in the translation there. I'm sorry about that, but you have it. You have it anyway. So congratulations. We'll give a, a round of applause uh, by whatever means the technology uh, uh, permits to John Braithwaite. And congratulations, Sean, on, on, on this award. We're, we're delighted for you and we're delighted for our field that we are able to honour you today for your, for your lifetime's work. And uh, I'm going to hand over to you now because not only are you here to receive the award, you're also here to uh, give give a lecture, and I won't give any further introduction, but I'll hand over to you, John, the floor is yours. And John's indicated he'll take some questions um, if there's time uh, after the after the lecture. So do think up your questions as he as he proceeds the lecture. John, we're over to you. Thank you, Colin. Uh, I acknowledge the uh, the elders of this Ewan land, 
that always was, always will be Aboriginal land. And thank you, Colin, for that kind uh, introduction. And to Alison and all of our friends at Essex who's, who've worked so hard, we really would have loved to have got over there with you. Val has been already to a conference at uh, Essex and has told me how warm the hospitality was and uh, what a beautiful place it was. So it really is a, is a disappointment, but we really admire the way you guys were set to put this on in person last year, had to cancel and, and then again have been through this uh, that this year. So you, you, you guys should be getting a resilience award rather than me an award. And it is an honor to get this uh, uh, award. And I, 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 I thank you for it. Uh, on any occasion like this, I, I always feel that uh, there are many people uh, uh, present and I'm looking. It's sort of worse on Zoom because you see not only their faces, but their names I'm, in that person would be more more worthy than me. But I'm, I'm very grateful. Uh, and, uh, you know, quite a number of those people, uh, people that uh, I, well, I, I think perhaps uh, uh, the reason that I got the award is that a number of the uh, key people uh, in uh, uh, ECPR are people who uh, have been involved in offering jobs to at times, uh, including including Colin and Imelda, and I see David there next on my screen, and also all these key players in ECPR. So I'm sure this is really a just reward for, for that, because I think, uh, it, uh, you know, a few people have an overrated view of my scholarship. Most people don't have that overrated view of my scholarship. But when I look at uh, people uh, uh, like uh, Colin giving that kind introduction and so many of the rest of, of you there, you all know who you are, those of you who I have been involved in offering jobs to in the past and uh, those whom I've mentored uh, in some way or been former PhD uh, uh, students, I, I do look out at you and take a lot of satisfaction in how you built this field, in how you've in particular been wonderful leaders of this particular network, but not only uh, this, uh, uh, this network and I, uh, I do think there, I do accept some acknowledgement of uh, of being in, involved in that. And I think we, we should evaluate scholars much more than we do in terms of what their students do, in terms of what their mentees do, because that is always such a, a larger sum of accomplishment than what an individual scholar does, particularly one like is ours, which is a, a community of, of conversation. And that's my topic, of course. Uh, and Valerie, of course. How can I not thank uh, Valerie on a on a lovely occasion uh, like this? So many of my ideas have been uh, infused with with her uh, keen insight. In August two thousand and seven, six advanced nuclear armed cruise missiles were mistakenly loaded on a B fifty two bomber named Doom ninety nine at a North Dakota. Airbase. In spite of various moments when protocols required the crew to verify that the missiles were not armed, no one checked for live weapons at any mandated stage. The plane with its nuclear armed cruise missiles sat overnight on the tarmac in North Dakota, unguarded. Next day, it flew 2,400 kilometers across the United States to Louisiana, where it sat on a tarmac there, unguarded again, um, for another nine hours before a maintenance crew realized that it carried nuclear weapons that were live. There were 36 hours before maintenance became the first to realize that six live nuclear missiles had gone missing. Findings of dereliction of duty followed. Uh, this is not a story from Pakistan where mobile nuclear vehicles, nuclear missiles endlessly drive the highways to avoid Indian detection, where there's so much fear of them, for, of them going missing into the hands of the Taliban. This is a story of North Dakota. We know in the United States, there have been many dozens of serious incidents or accidents involving nuclear warheads, doubtless more that have not become public. 
The most worrying incidents take a long time to leak, often by very old leakers who want to do the right thing before they die. By this time, states can say uh, that these were governance failures of a different era. Um, for example, the most potentially catastrophic accidental cascades toward nuclear war during the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962 did not leak until this century. It was not until 2021 that the New York Times leaked that in 1958, a time of Chinese artillery bombardment of Taiwan, the US High Command had, had advocated and prepared for a nuclear first strike against China. President Eisenhower, old general of World War II, was terrified and an unusually potent president for shutting down this Pentagon adventurism. The leaker of these secret documents was old and openly invited his prosecution for the leak. So here is my first law of geopolitics. Geopolitics is full of well-concealed recklessness in incipient promotion of mass destruction. But there's a bigger risk. My second law of geopolitics is accidental nuclear war is a much higher risk than intended nuclear war. A corollary from these laws, dumb luck is the reason that neither nuclear accidents nor the intent of crazies have not yet caused mass extinctions of species and global famine. My hope in this lecture is to inspire some researcher out there to do a particular kind of, of regulatory research to make better luck for the planet. You don't make that contribution by studying the governance failures of high profile events like the Cuban Missile Crisis, the 1958 Taiwan missile nuclear, nuclear tilt, because by the time you get the leaks, the case relates to yesterday's governance, yesterday's technologies. The senior players will be too dead to interview. The contribution I want to inspire is with domestic incidents like Doom 99 uh, that are less sensitive, more recent and less sensitive because they're domestic rather than international and do not blow up to, to harm any person, to actually harm any person or any international relationship. For such cases, you can get surprisingly good documentary evidence, albeit heavily redacted and some retired people you can interview. My proposed project for some future regulatory governance researcher involves studying incidents like North Dakota 2007. There had been earlier incidents before Doom 99 where nuclear weapons or sensitive parts of them uh, had gone missing for a period while they'd been sent hither and thither, including to foreign countries not authorised to access that technology. For four years before Doom 99, in 2003, half of US Air Force units responsible for nuclear weapons failed their nuclear surety inspections, even though they had advance warning of the inspections. Surety inspections uh, means safety and security inspections. One of the bomber wings that failed its nuclear surety inspection in 2003 was that wing in North Dakota that left the live missiles unguarded on two tarmacs and flew them across America. This Air Force Inspector General report found that the pass rate for nuclear surety inspections had been in decline for some time and hit an all time low in 2003. The hypothesis I advance for future research is uh, neoliberal and insufficiently responsive, of course, I would say responsive, neoliberal and unresponsive regulatory institutions for air and space threaten catastrophe. I know many, but not all of you agree with me that the evidence is reasonably good that old fashioned street level governance by inspection does work in areas related to safety. In contrast, evidence that it's sound policy to replace conversational inspections with desk audits or robo auditing is thin. 
as Valerie Braithwaite's presentation in the hour, early hours of our, our morning on robo debt in Australia showed, such a shift can be catastrophically counterproductive and expensive. That's not to deny that there are some things computers can control more reliably than humans. Flying a plane safely in most circumstances is already one of them. Yet we know from high quality empirical research on the Afghanistan war uh, that when there is a human interface, drones regulated by computers usually kill the wrong persons. In aggregate, murdering very high ratios of children and other non-combatants to intended targets. Mafia method, method is more relational and street level regulation that is therefore more reliable, uh, uh, more tidy. Uh, you have a brief conversation with a person in search of contextual evidence of targeting error, uh, then end the conversational regulation of reliability with a bullet in the head. The RAND Corporation does not agree with me on inspections. RAND leans, leans toward what we might in 2021 call an old fashioned neoliberal view of deregulating the inspections that fetter the military industrial complex of which RAND is a part. In 2013, RAND produced a technical report for the US Air Force called charting the course of a new, new Air Force inspection system. It opens under, the, under a heading entitled, Reducing the Inspection Footprint. I quote from it. The Air Force is seeking ways to reduce one, the number of days each year that a wing is subject to some external oversight event. Two, uh, the resources consumed by both inspectors and inspectees for each event. To this end, the Air Force has already begun synchronizing inspector general inspections and functional assessments so they occur on the same days. It also plans that fewer external inspectors and assessors are required and wing personnel spend less time preparing for and talking with those who come. I've concluded that the Air Force industrial complex are not enthusiasts for the implications of Julia Black's conversational regulation when they say they want less time wasting talking to regulator. Who carries the, the conversation? Not RAND in this context. Like RAND, I personally trust the US Air Force to self-report. Ah, by the way, General, yesterday we stuffed up almost caused World War III by accidentally slipping our weapons onto nuclear alert. No need to worry, no harm done. Everything is secured now. Sure, they can be trusted to report that kind of thing. What I find amazing is that the policy debates around how to regulate the surety of the US nuclear arsenal are so like those around the regulation of aged care in Australia, a topic on which Valerie and I laboured long and fruitlessly. So fruitlessly that 80% of COVID deaths in Australia have been in aged care homes. Most of these deaths could have been averted by inspection and compliance with straightforward inspection control, infection control protocols mandated by laws that we were involved in bringing into effect in the 1980s. One of those shared issues between aged care and nuclear care is on the imperative for some of the inspections to be surprise inspections, contrary to the RAND recommendations. This came up in Major General Raberg's report into this flight of six live nuclear warheads from North Dakota. The general found that the absence of no notice inspections was one proximate cause. He reported, most units adequately prepare and stand poised when the nuclear surety team arrives. They, are tr they have trained the A team to meet the inspectors and the B team to be in the shadows when possible. Pretty familiar phenomenon to most of us. Who carries the conversation? General Raberg does. And we as an intellectual community must carry it forward with him. The general used 
Doom 99 to open the lid on a widespread problem, concluding the intricate system of nuclear checks and balances was either ignored or disregarded. He found that if the senior controller had access the software tracking program MUNSCON to verify its status, it would have been instantly apparent that nuclear weapons were moving about in breach of safety protocols. While algorithmic regulation was on tap to Air Force risk management, the algorithms were like fire alarms that shut off when the fire gets hottest. General Raburg reported that when staff came to the special weapons flight meetings, uh, not only were their computers not switched on, they did not even have the printed maintenance schedule and knew nothing of a 1978 form designed to counter this risk called the weapons custody transfer document. It had fallen into disuse. No one knew it was tucked away in a forgotten corner of a website for decades. The general reported, every witness testified that they came to the special weapons flight meetings with blank notebooks. They relied on an erroneous set of slides produced by a very young plans and scheduling airman, a one striper. Scary, isn't it? They're just like us, attending regulatory governance meetings with blank notebooks, staring at false PowerPoints. My take, of course, is that what was required in this wing was a more conversational and restorative form of regulation. This was because General Raburg concluded that bullying was a root cause of the incident. Robo regulation or desk auditing can't catalyze a healing transformation of a subunit that shakes in fear of a bully. The general wrote in his report, verbal testimony indicates that X was an ineffective leader who routinely chastised his personnel. His subordinates frequently worked through lunch. He would keep them beyond normal work hours without pay in an effort to assert his dominance. He created a hostile working environment and so on in which subordinates would not go to him for help or advice. If the US domestic nuclear weapons regulatory regime is such a worry, how big a worry is the North Korean or Pakistan regime? In the era of cyber ops against securities markets, the risk is palpable. When a Pakistan general can say, crash of the Karachi stock exchange that is inexplicable will be interpreted as an act of war by India and should trigger nuclear alerts. This in relation to a Karachi exchange, highly prone to crash because its economy has been bailed out 13 times by the IMF, most recently in 2019. One way that US nuclear surety uh, inspection is even more worrying than Australian aged care uh, inspection is about the depth of military industrial complex entanglement illustrated through the RAND report. Lockheed Martin is a funder of my own university space research, which to some degree has been militarized in ways that worry me. Lockheed is a huge player in nuclear weapons program. It's the world's largest military contractor. In 2016, Lockheed, who was managing the database for the US Department of Defense, lost 100,000 Air Force Inspector General files. All of its freedom of information request, all reports relating to Inspector General complaints, Inspector General investigations and appeals. The Air Force reported that the data had been lost in a crash not caused by attack from outside. A week or so later, they found them again. Hardly inspires confidence for data so sensitive and important. But at least these files that I am commending to regulation researchers for now are available again for us to try to access with US freedom of information law. Brent Fissi and I long ago visited firms like Lockheed to discuss what was Lockheed's modus operandi in corrupting so many world leaders as senior as Prime Minister Tanaka of Japan.
It seems to me important for universities to get firms like Lockheed that have an interest in expanding sales of dangerous products to get them right out of being financially and collaboratively entangled with our university aerospace researchers. Secondly, it seems important that independent university regulatory governance researchers supplant corporate members of the military industrial complex like Lockheed and Rand as leaders of research and thinking on regulatory safety around weapons of mass destruction. One reason is that regulatory researchers connect governance up to a global imagination that transcends corporate interests and national security policy frames. My ambition for this lecture was to move from the street level reimagining of nuclear regulation discussed so far to realist international relations theory in global regulatory institutions. Alas, little time left for that. In the next few years, hopefully I'll complete a book uh, that's tentatively titled Simple Thinking About Complex Catastrophes. I'll argue that the stuff of this lecture matters because cyber ops or even cyber crime in and around US nuclear command or Chinese or India nuclear command and control systems on earth or in space could spark a response that inadvertently escalates conventional conflict into nuclear war. Someone targets a satellite for conventional reasons or reason, even reasons of criminality without reason, realizing that satellite is secretly central to the launch of nuclear weapons. Crises today increasingly cascade into one another. This is true of economic and ecological crises, the globalization of disease and security crises. Crises develop increasingly rapidly. Uh, the speed thing is because of accelerating innovation in global capitalism. New technologies of cyber warfare and cyber terrorism, new weapons in space that disable satellites uh, uh, can destabilize peace. Rapidity of changes is compounded by the tightly coupled character of crises. As Warren, Warren Buffett said of the 2008 cascade of economic crisis, risks today are more coupled than in the past. So collapse of a US bank more readily cascades to collapse of European banks. How can there be simple solutions to the speed of coupled crises that are complex? One answer is that a slow food approach to institutional preparedness is needed when societies are buffeted by cascades of tightly coupled crises. A quality university system uh, that is not captured by the very military industrial complex that is throwing babies over the waterfall is a simple enough institutional imperative. Strong universities are vital to building strong markets, designing effective regulatory institutions and energizing civil society. I don't need to say that to this audience. So are quite simple regulatory architectures that allow inspectors to arrive at Air Force bases on surprise checks that nuclear weapons are properly secured from cyber attack, from incompetence, from military sloth, from bullies. Regulatory institutions of many kinds can be as simply secured against capture by firms like Lockheed as can universities. States of modest means like Mongolia and New Zealand are capable of outstanding accomplishments through institutions of pandemic preparedness, uh, ready to respond to complexity, uncaptured by Big Pharma or anyone else. I choose them as the two societies performing best in the league table of excess deaths per capita during the, uh, the COVID pandemic to date. Many relatively poor states close to the initial outbreak like Vietnam also had sound and simple pandemic preparedness institutions in place and have performed almost as well as wealthier democracies like Mongolia, New Zealand, Taiwan. 
even after reopening uh, Vietnam to foreign tourists. When states like Australia and China are growling at each other like rabid dogs, university science scientists from Australia, Britain, the US, were publishing wonderful research together in The Lancet, in Nature, to identify the genetic sequence of COVID-19 and much more. When states are beating drums of war against each other, university people can and do reach across the chasm by leading track two diplomacy for peace. We do it at Regnet. An example of deadly simple institutional thinking is having a well-funded ambulance service that is nimble and designed to scale up speedily in response to major crises like the nuclear war that will come one day. That takes decades of slow food institutional development of an ambulance service cooked through experience with the complexity of lesser crises like COVID. Thinking slow and simple about the institutions required for rapid response to complex crises. COVID illustrated how developmental states like Taiwan had the required simple institutions of pandemic response crisis ready while states that had misplaced faith in market preparedness to respond to any and all ills did not. Trump's US, Johnson's UK, Bolsonaro's Brazil. Some formerly neoliberal states like Jacinda Ardern's New Zealand adapted well to behave more like a developmental state with simple institutions of adaptive preparedness. The demands of rapid waves of coupled crises require societal commitments to simple institutions of surrender to the realities of not getting the world we might want. Who wins the next election is not as important as having a stable system for transferring power from the last winner to the next one. Who wins the next great power contest is not as important as a stable system for moving on from the current to the next number one. Who is number one is less important the numbers two to five, accepting that who is number one recurrently changes with the march of history. Hence, work together for stable progress of all great powers to extinguish global and local crises that are destabilizing in a cascading way. World War I, which ended British incumbency as number one, was such an avoidable war. We can do better this time as US hegemony wanes. As we see with climate politics, with COVID and vaccine nat nationalism, realist international relations theory, making America or Britain great again is not very realistic. Even regional hegemony is not realistic. It did Napoleon no good, nor Hitler, nor any of those with such ambitions during the 30 years war in Europe. Japan's project for regional Asian hegemony have also been duds. When we university scholars engage our Chinese friends in conversations about why Chinese hegemony, regional hegemony is not in the interests of China, they of course retort, well, the US has managed to have stable regional, regional hegemony over the Americas for more than a century. Why can't we in Asia? We university people must engage them with the counterpoint that American regional hegemony has not been stable. It has created the most violent region in the world with the highest rates of police killing and common murders, the highest rates of COVID, massive contributions to climate catastrophe, the three largest precautionary lenders from the IMF. So we scholars must engage our Chinese friends please do not do for Asia what the US did for the Americas. That might blow back to violence inside China in the way the violence of the Americas uh, does already blow back into the US and has for a long time. Uh, so realist international relations thinker will say, of course, states will act on the basis of, uh, of, of vaccine nationalism, but vaccine nationalism is not realistic for for obvious reasons. It's not in the it's not in the long run interests of uh, of uh, of any country, especially big ones which have lots of travel interconnections. Great powers have less to fear from each other than from failures to work effectively with each other 
to tame global and regional threats to the well-being of their people. Hence my conclusion uh, that one interpretation of my Doom 99 story that is unattractive is, oh, that's unfortunate, but such accidents are a price that must be paid to preserve US hegemony. That's an unattractive interpretation for me because risks of war are so catastrophic, we all have an interest in stability and balances of power that change at a pace societies have time to adjust to. Suites of institutional stabilizers are needed that are learning institutions, but that are tried and true, simple enough for poorer societies like North Korea or Pakistan. We need to defend simple regulatory institutions with stable foundations for learning how to sustain complex tasks, such as the World Health Organization and the nuclear non-proliferation regime that, after all, has kept 90% of the world, 96% of the world's state nuclear weapons free. Thank you. Thank you, John. And, uh... I was so excited about your lecture and the topic, and I've not been disappointed. You painted on a huge global canvas and set the challenges for university scholars. I particularly loved the line that you hope to inspire regular research to make better luck for the planet. What if we could, what if we as a standing group on regulatory governance could achieve that through our collaborative enterprises over the coming years? inspired by our awardee of our Regulatory Studies Award, uh, John Braithwaite. As I mentioned, John's kindly agreed to take uh, questions. Um, you can put a question in the chat, or I could even, might even let you put the microphone on if you want to ask directly. We're, we're um, a reasonably uh, you know, small group, or you could raise a hand. Then we've got a question I'd like to start with. I might come, just coming on to start, I'm just wondering, John, about the risks of universities engaging with finance from major companies. You mentioned Lockheed and your own university and, and regret at the linkage, the risk to independence of universities and university research. Um, someone, someone said, well, why do you rob the bank? Well, that's where the money is. And I mean, university systems starved of funds as you are in Australia and we are in many parts of the world, not everywhere. You know, need to find you know, funds to do things. Isn't it possible to, to isolate um, the funding uh, stream so the space people aren't presumably knocking on the door of the regulation people to say, stop doing this autonomous regulation research? Um, are Chinese walls possible or is it really necessary to say we mustn't have any link with the, the industrial military companies or indeed other controversial uh, unethical activities that might bring funding into universities? Well, we all have responsibilities to carry this conversation in our own universities. And it is, it's not, it's not black and white. Uh, I mean, my, my own view is that if you're getting funding from someone who produces dangerous products, who, who has an interest in increasing sales of dangerous products, be they nuclear weapons or tobacco, that's the kind of funding uh, one, uh, ought not to accept. And I mean, most people agree on tobacco, but alcohol is a different matter. You might remember, Colin, when you were a, a, a younger scholar at Regnet, uh, we had an approach uh, uh, from a, uh, a large uh, international alcohol corporation, uh, who particularly sold Celtic beverages, actually, uh, who wanted to give us a lot of money at Regnet uh, to set up a, a centre for regulation of alcohol. And our dean was very keen that we accept that money. And we had our faculty meeting. We decided we did not, we did not want to do that. And likewise, we decided in the early days of Regnet that we didn't want funding from Crown Casino for our centre uh, for our gambling uh, research. Uh, our vice chancellor went off to the United States and uh, 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 thinking that uh, on his visit to the Pentagon, there would be a lot of interest uh, about our science faculties for 
uh, funding projects, which in those days, before the aerospace days, there, there actually wasn't much uh, interest in doing that, but they were interested in funding Regnet, you know, they wanted to fund Regnet to do work in Afghanistan on region with the US military on areas that have been pacified to foster a kind of restorative kind of uh, reconciliation and reintegration. And again, the Vice Chancellor was annoyed with us that we said no. When we're not going to do that, we, we are going to continue doing work on uh, reconciliation and reintegration and restorative justice, but we're not going to do it in collaboration with the US military. Now, in, in all of those cases, I think those judgments were, were right and not so hard. Um, in the case of that work by the military, lots of great empirical research was done that has shown that the people who did do that research, it had very counterproductive effects, that things that would otherwise be helpful humanitarian things to be doing on the ground in a place like in uh, Afghanistan actually end up increasing the number of deaths that occur on, on the ground when they're done in connection with the military. You know, they create honeypots that are reasons to, uh, to launch attacks to seize resources and so on. So I think it's, uh, uh, there are many more difficult areas like accepting monies from the pharmaceutical industry, for example, where you would say, oh, well, John, you know, pharmaceuticals can be dangerous products and you've written a lot of, ab about that, corporate crime in the pharmaceutical industry. And yes, you know, pharmaceuticals are after all tamed poisons that often, do a lot of good. There, I think a more nuanced answer comes out of the conversation, which is to say, unfortunately, the evidence is that there's been a huge shift in funding. Your point, Colin, the money is in the industry and not in the National Institute of Health so much these days as it, as it used to be. So the percentage of funding in the United States in that area that comes from the pharmaceutical, for, that comes from government funders has reduced from 60% to 30%. Um, and the unfortunate consequence of that is that in the, uh, in the studies that are funded by Big Pharma, the probability of coming out with the outcome that the drug is effective, that there are no uh, adverse uh, effects, uh, that the drug actually works are four times as high as in studies that are funded by government funding agencies. So there lies the problem. There is capture in the structure of the funding. So the world would be a better place if we moved back as much as we could toward that world of a bigger welfare state where the state was actually funding more of the research into pharmaceuticals. Excellent. It's just possible that COVID might give us a slightly bigger version of the state, of course, for a whole variety of reasons. So, yeah. Carl, there's just one more question anyone wants to ask in this session. It's not essential because we've got plenty of business to do. Going, going. Christine, yes. Hi, John. Um, yeah, I've got a question, or it's actually more a comment um, or a suggestion for action. Um, I agree with John that there's simple, I like the slow food analogy, there's simple slow food things that regulatory um, scholars and entrepreneurs could be working on that are generative of solutions to um, complex problems. And it seems to me that um, there could be, you know, a list of 10 or 12 basic governance things that we expect, substantive things like, you know, decent social security um, and um, uh, taxes on certain um you know, financial activities and uh, conflicts of interest rules around lobbying or no allowance of political donations or so on. But there ought to be sort of 10 or 12 things that all different social movements could agree on and that would make a huge difference in all areas of substantive business regulation because they create the conditions in which um, regulation 
can work effectively. And that's something I've been thinking about for a while that, you know, across all our different domains, we should be able to come together and agree on these basic things that we should be all saying are actually foundations of, of decent regulation. Comment. Thanks. Thanks, Christine. Yeah. I'll give you I'll yeah. give you one minute, I, John. I'll give you I, one minute, I, John, to respond. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I agree. No, no need to uh, respond. I mean, just the, the only addendum I would make and, and to build a regulatory community. So if it's anti-corruption commissions, for example, that there's a, a transnational regulatory culture of anti-corruption commissions, which embrace the civil society activists that succeeded in getting the anti-corruption commissions as established and, and traditions of mutual learning triple loop learning, uh, Christine, uh, globally across the anti-corruption anti commissions. John, thank you so much for a, a, accepting our award today and for an absolute tour de force, setting our agenda for the next decades in regulatory governance research, perhaps. Really appreciate uh, such a wide ranging uh, lecture. Thank you so much. We have it recorded, I understand, so that we can make it available to the, to the regulatory governance community the challenges that uh, John has thrown. Thank you so much, John. Very much appreciated. Uh, the last part of our session today um, is the very happy task of presenting the uh, Gianna Monica Mione Prize for an early career paper at the conference. The prize committee was chaired by Ulrika Morth and comprised Ulrika Morth, Martin Lodge, Alessia de Monte and Kern Verhoust. And the, uh, I'm delighted to say that this year we are presenting the award to Jose Maria Valenzuela, University of Oxford, for the paper, System Operators and Regulatory Governance for the Rapid Decarbonization of Electricity Systems, a State Business Configuration Perspective. Before I ask Jose Maria to come forward and receive the award, I will just read the citation uh, from the committee, which Ulrika, as chair of the committee, asked me to read to you. Uh, the Mione Prize 2021 goes to Jose Maria Valenzuela for the paper, Systems Operators and Regulatory Governance for the Rapid Decarbonization of Electricity Systems, a State Business Configuration Perspective. The paper advances our understanding of regime dynamics on different national experiences, regulatory structures, and legacies in the governance of electricity systems, and how governments can overcome the government's dilemma by mechanisms of reconfiguration of state business regulations. The paper addresses a highly important and clear research problem makes a convincing argument for how the study contributes to previous research on electricity governance. The paper includes an extensive discussion of country cases and offers rich insights into state business configurations in four different systems. So Jose Maria, congratulations. Uh, I have your uh, certificate here. And uh, I don't know if I can, uh, I don't know if I can pass this over to you. Any, any luck with that? Uh, oh yes, we're on a good, good run of roll today. Well done, Jose Maria. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank and you. Uh, I know that uh, this award is one that has really set people up well in our regulatory governance community. We've got a, uh, we've got a minute to Jose Maria. Do you want to, uh, if you want to, a, a brief, some brief remarks? Yeah. Th thank you, Colin. Thank you to the committee. I'm very honoured to receive the award. It is as an early career scholar, this is obviously a thrill to have such a positive feedback. I found. Uh, regulatory studies as a fantastic home to do my own research, uh, which I actually started by reading on regulatory capitalism from professors like Professor Braidwhite or uh, Hassin Jordana or uh, Professor Levin Fowler in this Zoom, same Zoom call. So this is, uh, this is fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, that, that concludes uh, this uh, ceremonial session of giving of awards. I, I hope very much that when we gather next to do these awards, we will be in person uh, together. Uh, it's very hard for us all, I think, managing so many different dimensions of the COVID, of COVID pandemic. I'm so pleased we were able to get together for the conference virtually. And congratulations to John and to Jose Maria for, for, for their awards. And thank you all for being in the session today. We'll wrap up now and the next session of the conference begins in five minutes at uh, well, nine o'clock Exeter time. You can work out what time it is with you. Thank you all very much.